Hello. Hola. Bonjour. Привет. Ни хао. Hello and welcome to Language with You. I hope we will watch the previous part where we kind of did a review of Darwin's theory of evolution and his theory of our language, which leaves much to be desired, and we're going to see how and why. So in this part, I want to go a little bit into biology to recommend a book, actually, that uh, you may not have uh, heard of, but that in my opinion changes your entire view about uh, evolution and and brings back the um, the wonder, the awe that we can feel when we look at nature, when we look at uh, living organisms, when we look at ourselves, and that is usually um, very often missed in the academia or whenever you hear or read anything about biology. So this is a book uh, by Michael Behe. Um, there's many others. I will put the bibliography at the bottom of this video, but. This one is particularly good and easy to understand. Here we go. It's called Darwin's Black Box, and um, it's, uh, it's going to take you through a journey uh, about evolution and about things that are very uh, tiny, tiny, tiny in nature, but very complex. When we extrapolate that to language later, you'll see how ridiculous Darwinian theories look in comparison. But let's, let's start with something simple that he says. I'm basing myself on his book, but also on a talk that I'm going to link to at the bottom as well, if you want to listen to it. And it's basically that uh, for him and for many others, evolution does not seem like something unguided, unplanned, random, that just happened by chance, basically. Um, why? Because, well, you can forgive Darwin because at the time uh, he was writing, uh, there was no uh, genetics. They didn't know the content of the cell. In fact, that's his. That's the black box that he mentions in the title. It's uh, something unknown that does wonderful things, but we don't know where it comes from, how it works, or anything. At the time of Darwin, the cell was kind of like a blob, a jello. Um, and now we have, you know, diagrams like this one that you're seeing on the screen, um, and every single part of the cell composes. Uh, it's, it's part of a giant factory, actually. It's so complex that it's difficult to imagine why it would have uh, arisen from random mutations with no purpose at all. Basically, that's the premise of the book. Okay, but let's see some of the arguments. Um, the way you define, or he defines uh, design, is a purpose, purposeful, I can never pronounce that word, purposeful arrangement of parts. Uh, basically, if it looks like it was done for a purpose, and there are, the parts are all organized, like in, a, like in an engine, like in a watch, etc., then there is a design. When we look at it, we say there is a design, right? Somebody or something designed it. And it, we usually infer that whenever we see something uh, that is made to accomplish a function. Um, if you look at a car, you know that it was designed, that its parts are arranged for a reason in the way they are, and um, that they need to accomplish a function, driving the car, right? Okay, so when you look at, at it in nature, uh, or anything else, you will see, for example, if I, if I show you this picture of, a, of, the mount, of these mountains, you could say, well, how did they come uh, to be? Maybe it was a move, shift in tectonic plates, and something happened in the Earth atmosphere, and the mountains uh, came to be, right? Well, but what, what happens if I show you this picture now? Would you, would you be able to give it any random, any non... Uh, imagine that it came to exist without any designer, without any builders uh, forming the shapes? Obviously not, right? Okay, so that's a funny example that he gives, kind of to give you the, uh, the idea that when you look at nature, many, many things in nature, you're going to say, wait a minute, that's got to be designed. Is, is, is intricate, it has a purpose, it has a, a definite, definite traits that somebody would have thought about, or something. That's number one. Number two is that even the uh, hardcore Darwinists agree that certain aspects of bio biology appear to be designed. In fact, many of them, if you look at uh, Richard Dawkins, for example, they'll, try, they'll say what we look at appears to be a design, and we have to explain it. Our, our role is to explain it via random mutations, gradual evolution, etc. 
So they're not saying that they don't see the design. What they're saying is, we believe that it has to be uh, the way Darwin explained it. So when they look at wings, for example, a wing is super, super complex. Each tiny component of a wing has a, um, a function, and it all works together. So, But for them, for the Darwinists, it all came to be very gradually. Maybe one type of feather came to, uh, started existing because of a certain reason. That allowed for better reproduction or survival, and then the other parts started working, except that as we'll see later, that doesn't happen very often, in fact, hardly ever. And in the same way, when you look at a plane, for example, I mean, we know it's designed, we know it's engineered, we know it took many, many human beings to produce it, and look at the simplicity of a plane uh, uh, compared to uh, the, the wings of, a, of the tiniest bird in existence. So there's something there that doesn't really, um, really match, because if you can acknowledge that there's design in this plane, for example, why wouldn't you acknowledge it in a bird? That's just one example. Number three is that there are structural obstacles to Darwinian evolution, he says. Now, let me quote Darwin here first. He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous, successive, slight modifications, my theory, my theory would absolutely break down but I can find no such case. Again, at the time of Darwin, uh, there was no um, serious work done in microbiology. Now there is. Now we don't have an excuse to continue believing in this. We'll see why. One of the main uh, principles that, um, that Behe uh, brings up is the idea of irreducible complexity. And he defines it as a single system which is composed of several interacting parts that contribute to the basic function and where the removal of any one of the parts causes the system to effectively stop functioning. Well, he always gives the example in his talks and in his book um, of the mousetrap because it's the simplest kind of machine that you can think of where if you remove any of the parts, it stops working. It completely breaks down. Or you can use it for something else, maybe, but it won't be a mousetrap anymore. If you remove the hammer, the spring, etc., the board. Um, so uh, that, to him, is an example of an irreducibly complex uh, organism, or machine in this case. And he, he shows, little by little, that um, many, many things in nature, in fact, uh, well, he, he doesn't want to say it. He, he talks about only microorganisms. I'm saying this. Everything in nature is irreducibly complex, or at least most of it. So, why is this important? Because if natural selection had waited for all these parts that work together to fulfill a function to exist, then they wouldn't, it wouldn't be necessary anymore. And the timing is off. If, um, if you need part A to make part B work, work and vice versa, then they both have to um, have come about at the same time. Otherwise, there would be no purpose for part A to exist to begin with. If its only mission is to help part B, which came later, then why would it be selected by natural selection, see? So there's a, that's where the whole Darwinian theory kind of breaks down, if you really think about it. Um, and that's also where uh, many um, enemies, I would say, or deterrents of um, Michael Behe and other authors uh, show that it's it's not really science, it's an ideology, it's not biology, it's an ideology, like he says. They're so fervent about opposing this simple principle that they say it's all about um, it's all about religion and uh, we shouldn't even look at it, it's, there's always an explanation in gradual evolution, except they can't really give it, it's just theories and explanations for why one thing happened or the other. So, keep this idea of redu irreducible complexity in mind, because we're going to use it also for language. One of the examples he gives in his book and in his talks is the um, bacterial flagellum. Now, this is just the tiny, tiniest, the, the tail of a bacteria, right? And we're talking about super microscopic organisms. This guy has like 40 components, um, 20 or so of which who... Uh, uh, which are not in any other organisms or not wouldn't fulfill any other purpose than what they do 
in this particular movement. It makes the bacteria swim. Uh, and it all works exactly like a motor, like an engine in a boat. And each of the parts work together. Without, if you lose one, the whole system breaks down. And if you don't have the all of them, the whole system doesn't work. So for it to have been gradual evolution, it's impossible. Maybe you can say, well, all the parts evolved at the same time by several random mutations. But then you still have the same uh, problem that there would have had to be uh, something or somebody that decided what the purpose of the organism would, was going to be like. Otherwise, what's the point in creating all those parts, right? So, um, ultimately, it comes down to the fact that um, it's all fairy tales. When, when Darwinians explain evolution in the way they do, it's not very unlike uh, stories like Kipling, you know, just so stories. If, you, if you're Anglo-Saxon, you probably know them. Um, the idea that, you know, how ze zebras got their stripes, you know, because they were hiding under a tree and the shade uh, blocked part of their body and then they realized that they camouflage better or something like that, as the story goes. But anyway, it's not science. Basically, it's not science because there's no evidence for a how these random mutations would occur and why they would occur. And finally, he says um, that everywhere in nature there's a strong evidence for design, as I mentioned in the beginning, and that we should use the inductive, obviously it's misspelled here, uh, it's a pun, inductive reasoning, uh, which means that, you know, if something looks like a duck and walks like a duck, then it may be a duck, right? Well, if it's something looks designed and acts like it's designed, then it's probably designed. But Darwinists will say no. That's all random mutations, natural selection, etc. Chance. And we come from apes. So that's it for um, for Behe's theory of, uh, not theory of evolution, but uh, he, what, what he's trying to explain is that not every, everything in nature, some of it may be explained by in Darwinian terms, but not everything in nature um, can be explained that way. And he sticks to microbiology, um, and he says, you know, for example, the flagellum of the bacteria or uh, some cells in the immune system. He explained to you, explains to you how it all works and how it's impossible for it to have arisen little by little. Um, in my opinion, it's not too much of a stretch of the imagination to say that if you can find that in microorganisms, then it's way more likely, likely that you'll find it in, um, in the whole, in, in more complex organisms in uh, human beings and in our language capacity. When we talk about uh, each biological component and the brain, the vocal tract, etc., we'll see that um, it's extremely, extremely complex and for it to have arisen little by little is a fairy tale. Thanks for watching. See you next time.